Hey there guys, this is Matt George with LexTraining.com and in this video I'm going to show you how to create a virtual machine using VMware Workstation 6.5. As you can see I already have my VMware Workstation loaded and there's two ways to create a new virtual machine. You can actually click on the new virtual machine icon here in the home screen of the VMware Workstation console or if the home screen is hidden like this you can actually right click here on the sidebar and select new virtual machine this way. Either way it takes you to the same new virtual machine wizard. The first step in the new virtual machine wizard here presents you with two options, typical and custom. Typical is your basic five quick and easy steps to creating a new virtual machine, whereas custom will give you a wide variety of options, such as how much RAM and how many processors will be allocated to this virtual machine, as well as what type of hard drive this virtual machine will use, whether it be IDE or SCSI based, or you could even use a physical disk, such as an external hard drive or a USB flash drive. For this video, I'm going to configure a custom virtual machine, so I'm going to click custom and then click next. Now you were given the option to select the workstation hardware compatibility mode of this virtual machine. Since I am running VMware Workstation 6.5, it will actually default to this, but you can select previous workstation compatibility modes such as 6, 5, and 4. You can also configure this virtual machine to be ESX server compatible, but keep in mind that you have to use SCSI hard drives. You cannot use IDE hard drives on ESX server compatible virtual machines. This is because ESX server does not support IDE. For this video, I'm going to go ahead and leave it here at the default of Workstation 6.5 and click Next. This step is actually a new feature in VMware Workstation 6.5. You now have the option to specify how VMware Workstation will install the operating system from the new virtual machine wizard itself. You can choose to install the operating system from a CD or DVD by using the physical disk drives of your workstation. As you can see here, I have a D drive and a V drive. Or you can also choose to install the operating system from an ISO file which is basically an image of the CD or the DVD itself. And of course the last option here is the default option, which instructs the wizard that you will install the operating system at a later time, and the wizard will create a blank, unpartitioned hard drive. I recommend you use the ISO option to install your operating system, as it will cut the installation time of the operating system in half, if not more. If you have a CD or a DVD of the operating system you wish to install, then you can easily rip it to an ISO and use that as well. For this video, I'm going to accept the default, which is I will install the operating system at a later time because I'm not going to install an operating system in this video, and now I'm going to click Next. Now you get to choose the guest operating system, which will be the operating system running on this virtual machine. As you can see, you have five options, Microsoft Windows, Linux, Novell Netware, Sun Solaris, and other. The other option is just a basic virtual machine template which you can use if your operating system is not listed here. With each guest operating system choice, you actually are presented with a nice long list of versions relating to that operating system. For example, if you look at Microsoft here, we can choose to install Windows 3.1 all the way up to Windows Server 2008 64-bit edition. And if you choose Linux, you actually get a wide variety of Linux distributions to choose from, such as Red Hat Linux, uh, Mandriva, Turbo Linux, Ubuntu, or perhaps your Linux distribution is not on the list but it's built on a specific Linux kernel build you can actually select from down here. I'm going to go ahead and select Microsoft Windows and leave it at Windows XP Professional and go ahead and click Next. Now you get to give this virtual machine a name. You should give the virtual machine a unique name which identifies its purpose, or perhaps you have a corporate policy that dictates the naming convention of the virtual machines. I personally like to name my virtual machines the same as the virtual machine's host name. For me, it makes it easier to identify what machine it is on the network. You also have the option of changing the location as to where VMware will store the files at for this virtual machine, which includes the virtual hard drive file as well as the virtual machine's configuration file. For this video, I'm just going to accept the defaults and click Next. Now you have the option to select how many processors this virtual machine will have. Keep in mind when configuring this option, the number of processors selected will show up in the virtual machine as physical processors. For example, I have a single dual-core processor in the workstation that I'm creating this video on, and Windows Vista recognizes it as a single processor, but if I select two processors here, the virtual machine's operating system will recognize it as two physical processors and not a single processor with two cores. Windows XP Professional supports a maximum of two processors, but keep in mind that Windows 98, Windows Millennium Edition, and Windows XP Home Edition only supports a single processor. I recommend that you check with your operating system's documentation to verify how many physical processors your operating system can support. Since Windows XP Professional supports two processors, I'm going to select two processors here and click Next. Now you have the option to change the amount of memory that will be dedicated to this virtual machine. 
You can also see that VMware provides you with recommendations on the amount of memory to use on this virtual machine based on the operating system that I've previously selected. If you wish to change the amount of memory, you can just use the slider bar here, or you can manually type it in yourself. For this video, I'm going to give this virtual machine one gigabyte of RAM, which is 1,024 megabytes, and click Next. Now we are presented with the configuration options for the virtual machine's network connection. As you can see, the first option we see here is the bridge networking option. This option basically turns your workstation's network card into a virtual switch, allowing both the host machine and the virtual machine to communicate with the network resources using their own IP address. The second option we have here, which is network address translation, also known as NAT, will configure the virtual machine to use the host machine's IP address. This option is good to use when you are required to use a single IP address to communicate with the network. A good example of this being a point-to-point -point over Ethernet connection, which is commonly used in your DSL internet. This option will allow both the host machine and the virtual machine to communicate with the internet connection using the same IP address. The host only option creates a virtual private network for the virtual machines and the host machine. For example, if you have multiple virtual machines and they have this option selected, they can communicate with each other as well as the host machine, but they cannot communicate with public network resources. And the last option you can choose is to not use a network connection at all, which will completely isolate this virtual machine. This would be a good choice if you want to test the software in an isolated environment. The default for VMware Workstation 6.5 is network address translation, but with previous versions of VMware Workstation, it used to default to bridge network connection. For this video, I'm going to select the bridge network connection and click Next. Now you were given the option to select the type of SCSI adapter you want this virtual machine to use. Since I'm configuring this virtual machine to run Windows XP Professional, I can just skip this step. Now we are presented with the options to configure the virtual machine's hard disk. You can choose to create a new virtual disk, or you can reuse a previously configured virtual disk. Or as I said in the beginning of the video, you can use an external hard drive or a USB flash drive. I'm going to create a new disk and click Next. Now we have the option of selecting what type of virtual disk the virtual machine will use. In a previous step, you were given the option to select the SCSI adapter type. If you select SCSI here, the virtual machine will use the previously selected SCSI adapter type. Since I plan on installing Windows XP Professional, I'm going to go ahead and leave it at the recommended IDE and click Next. Now you have the option of specifying the maximum size of the virtual hard disk. You can also choose to allocate the disk space now, which will increase performance of the virtual machine, or you can let the virtual disk dynamically expand when the space is needed by the virtual machine. You also have the option to store the disk as a single file or multiple 2 gigabyte files, which makes transferring the virtual machine a lot easier. I'm going to go ahead and set the defaults here and click Next. As you can see now, we have the option to name our virtual hard disk file. The virtual hard disk file will actually default to the same name as the virtual machine's name. I'm just going to leave this alone and click Next. Now VMware has all the information required to create our new virtual machine. VMware will give you a summary of the options you've selected while creating the virtual machine so you can review the configuration prior to actually creating the virtual machine here within VMware Workstation. We also have the option of customizing the virtual machine's hardware. For example, if you wish to add additional peripherals or if you made a mistake in the new virtual machine wizard and you wish to fix it, you can configure or change those options from here. You can choose the power on the virtual machine after VMware has finished creating it but for this video, I'm going to skip this step and click Finish. Now that our new virtual machine has been created, there is one more thing that I'd like to show you, which is called the Virtual Hard Drive Map Utility. This utility will allow you to map a virtual hard drive to a drive letter in my computer on your host operating system. This is actually good if you want to transfer a file back and forth between your virtual machine to your host operating system. Well, I hope this video has been helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at mgeorge at lunchtrain.com. And thank you for viewing.